Hi everybody and welcome to a new video in the Sound Generation with Neural Networks series. Last time we discussed a number of different approaches that we can use to generate sounds and we said that one of these is autoencoders. And indeed, in this video, I'm going to introduce the intuition and the theory behind autoencoders. So let's get started. So what are autoencoders? Well, autoencoders are algorithms that belong to unsupervised learning. In other words, we use like a data without labels, we feed it to these autoencoders and we hope that these autoencoders will kind of make sense of that data automatically without g us giving them like any prior information. Now, specifically what autoencoders are great at is representation learning. Well, I'm sure you're not necessarily super familiar with representation learning, but this is like a very simple concept. So what representation learning is in the end is just learning patterns in data, learning structures that are uh, present in a data set. Okay, but now uh, what's the idea that we have, like the basic intuition that we can use like with autoencoders to learn like these representations of data. So we basically want to create an architecture that has a bottleneck and with the idea that this bottleneck is, is going to ensure a compressed representation of the original data. Now, in this sentence, the most important uh, like concepts are bottleneck and lower dimensional representation. In other words, like this bottleneck is going to enable us to have like a compressed representation of the original data. I know this can feel a little bit like uh, abstract. So now let's take a look at a, an example, at a visualization of an autoencoder. So here we have it. And as you can see, we have like on the left hand side, an input layer where we just like feed in like data, some kind of data. Then at the center, we have this bottleneck. And as you can see, it's indeed a bottleneck because it has a lower dimensionality when compared to the input layer. And then we have the output layer, which once again has the same dimension as the input layer. Now, an important thing to understand about autoencoders is that this is a quite complex network architecture that relies on two separate pieces. One is called an encoder and the other one is called a decoder. Let's try to visualize like these two parts. Let's start with encoder first. So this is like the encoder and its role is that of compressing data into a lower dimensional representation. In other words, we take like an, the uh, data as an input and then we learn weights so that we can compress down that data into a lower dimensional representation. This lower dimensional representation is often called a latent space. And a latent space is a representation of the original data which only focuses on the most important attributes or features. Okay, but in order for the encoder to be effective at compressing data, we need for a certain condition to be true. And that condition is that data should have dependencies across its different dimensions. In other words, if the different dimensions of, the, of data are all independent, it's basically impossible to learn a lower dimensional representation because there's no way of capturing most important like attributes without losing a lot of information. Okay, now you may be wondering, but is it an encoder, some kind of like dimensionality reduction algorithm? And is it comparable to other algorithms, like for example, PCA or principal components analysis? Well, in a certain sense, yes. So they both PCA and encoders, they both perform dimensionality uh, reduction, but PCA learns linear relationships, whereas encoders can learn non-linear relationships. Now, let's take a look at an example in 2D so that we can understand how PCA and encoders like 
uh, work differently. So here we have like our data and as you can see, uh, like our data is just like all of these dots. So with PCA, we can fit the data only with a line, whereas with uh, the encoder, we can have a nonlinear curve like this that follows like the, uh, the data, fits the data better. We can generalize this to as many dimensions as we want. In other words, PCA even in three, four or five dimensions can only capture linear relationships, whereas encoders can capture nonlinear relationships. What does this mean? Well, it means that with PCA, we can only uh, try to like compress data that has a relatively simple structure, whereas with encoders, we can capture relationships in data that has like more complex structures. But the cool thing here is that if we were to use a linear activation functions in an encoder, then the encoder wouldn't necessarily behave so differently from PCA because it, at the end of the day, it would learn a linear representation of the data. So the advantage that an encoder has is that it uses linear activation functions. Now, if you're not familiar with activation functions and uh, like these terms like are quite new to you, I highly suggest you to go check out my uh, series called Deep Learning for Audio with Python, where I just tackle all of these concepts in deep learning from scratch. And I also create like implementation in Python of this. Just check out the video or the series up here. Okay. Now let's go back like to encoders. So as we said, like the, the role of the encoder in an autoencoder is that of compressing initial data into a lower dimensional uh, representation and learning that representation. Now, what about decoders? Well, decoders just like do the opposite of that. In other words, a decoder decompresses a representation back to the original domain. So it starts from the uh, representation, from the lower dimensional representation, and then it tries to reconstruct the original uh, data. Okay, so as you can see, like in an autoencoder, we have like this kind of like mirrored uh, like image where like the encoder uh, compresses down data into the bottleneck and then the decoder uh, kind of like decompresses it up to like the original dimension. Okay. So we can like take a look like at this autoencoder and imagine like the whole uh, workflow like this. So we start with uh, the original data or like the input, then we just like uh, represent it here down in the bottleneck or in the latent space. And then here we have a reconstruction of the original data. Now the question is, but how can we train an autoencoder? Well, for training an autoencoder, we use, as it's usually the case uh, with neural networks, we use backpropagation. Now, I'm not gonna discuss the details of backpropagation, and if you're not familiar with that, I highly suggest you to go check out this video in the Deep Learning uh, for Audio with Python series. But the basic idea of backpropagation is that we need a way of like optimizing uh, like the uh, like the learning process. And for that, we need a, uh, an observable, let's call it this way, that's called loss or error. In the case of autoencoders, what we use is uh, a reconstruction error. And the basic idea is that we want to minimize the reconstruction error. But what's a reconstruction error? Well, we can indicate uh, a reconstruction error like this. And here we have like the original data and here we have the reconstructed data. And the reconstruction error is conceptually the difference between the original data and the reconstructed data. In other words, is the difference between the input data and the data that gets uh, spit out from the decoder. So we can take the difference there and so that we have an idea of how different the 
reconstruction is from the original data. Now, we can use a number of different uh, functions for uh, actually like implementing the reconstruction error, but one that is usually used is a mean square error, MSC, or RMSC, which is a root mean square error. Okay, so now what's an ideal autoencoder. So what are like the features or attributes that this autoencoder should have? Well, we want for an autoencoder to be sensitive enough to the input data so that it can reconstruct it. But at the same time, we want for an autoencoder to be insensitive enough to input data so that it doesn't memorize it, so that it avoids overfitting it, right? And this is like a difficult trade-off to achieve because on the one hand, we want to uh, we want for the autoencoder to learn a representation that represents well like the original data. So we have that representation that we can use to reconstruct the original data in a way like that's satisfactory. But at the same time, we don't want to learn all the unnecessary details of the input data. So this like looks like a mission impossible, but in but actually it's quite feasible. And in order to uh, do it, what we need like is a complex uh, loss function that has like two arguments. So the first one is the um, reconstruction error that we already introduced. And basically here the idea is that with the reconstruction error only, what we're going to do is that we're going to try to be as sensitive as possible to the input data so that we'll ensure that the network actually learns a representation that makes sense and can be used to reconstruct the input data. But at the same time, we need to add a re regularization term, uh, which uh, will help us avoiding overfit the input data. Now, uh, in the autoencoders, I'm not going to talk about like a regularization like too much, but this is going to be like a very important like topic when we'll arrive like at the upgraded version of an autoencoder, which is a variational autoencoder. So just like bear this like in mind for future videos. So there are two parts to the um, uh, to like a loss function for uh, an autoencoder and one is like the reconstruction error and the other part is regularization elements which we need in order to avoid uh, learning or overfitting the data. Okay, now uh, autoencoders uh, can be can have like deep structures and what do I mean by deep structure? Well, as you can see here, they can have like multiple layers before arriving at the bottleneck and usually you have like a structure that looks like this. So you start uh, like with uh, like a lot uh, like of like neurons, for example, and then you just like uh, go down like to uh, a layer that has like less neurons then less neurons and in the end, you arrive like at the bottleneck. But as you can see here, like this structure between the encoder and the decoder is completely mirrored. And this is like usually what happens with autoencoders. So we start like with the encoder, we uh, layer after layer, we reduce the dimension, dimensionality of the data until we get to the bottleneck. And then in the decoder, we just do the inverse of that. So we start like upsampling uh, like the data until we get to the output, which in most cases has the same dimensions as the original data. Okay, so one flavor of autoencoder that's very important and is the one that we'll be discussing the most is the so-called deep convolutional autoencoder. So this obviously has like a similar architecture to uh, um, a normal autoencoder, a vanilla autoencoder, but instead of having uh, like um, perceptions, it has like uh, convolutional layers. So 
And here, like in the deep convolutional autoencoder, still we have the encoder part and the decoder part. Uh, at the level of the encoder, each layer uh, is a block that we can kind of like imagine having like three different parts. So we have like a convolution, we use a leaky ReLU or leaky rectified linear unit as the activation function, and then we also apply batch normalization. So this happens at each layer in the deep convolutional autoencoder. Then when we get to the decoder part, what we have is yet again like a complex structure where we have like a convolution, but it's not convolution, it's the convolution transpose. Now, wh why do we use a convolution transpose? Well, the idea is that using convolutions, we can kind of like downsample the data, compress it with a convolution uh, transpose. We just obtain the opposite effects. We upsample data and that's what we want in a decoder. Okay. So in the decoder, at each layer, we have a convolution transpose. Then again, we have leaky uh, ReLU, and then we also apply batch normalization. So it's not always the case that you have like this elements in a deep convolutional autoencoder, but most of the time, this is like what you usually get. Okay, I'm sure now you had like a very important question, which is, Valerio, but why are you teaching us about like this incredible like architecture where you start with data, you compress it down, and just then to decompressing back like to the original data. So what's the point of that? Can we just use the input data? I mean, why do we need the reconstructed data? Why do we need compression at all? Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason is the latent space. And the latent space, as we've come to learn, uh, keeps the most important attributes of the input data. Now, having this uh, compressed version of the original data turns out to be very useful for performing uh, a number of different interesting tasks. Now, let's take a look at a few of these. So we can use autoencoders for generating data. And obviously that's what we are gonna do like in this series. And it's the whole point of choosing autoencoders for this series on sound generation with neural nets, right? Then we can use autoencoders for denoising data and we can denoise uh, images, we can denoise sound, whatever we want really. And then we can also use autoencoders for anomaly detection, detecting anomalies or malfunctions, for example, in a machine. And there are a bunch of other applications that I don't want to get into right now. Let's take a look at generation first with autoencoders. So here we have once again a visualization of an autoencoder, but the bottleneck is slightly different because now I want to have like a plane or a 2D space. So you can imagine uh, this is the X axis and this is the Y axis. Okay, so now let's see what happens once we train an autoencoder. Basically, the idea is that we can feed some data into the encoder. And uh, obviously here we can feed any type of data. It could be an image, it could be a raw audio, it could be a spectrogram. For the sake of this example, let's assume we are feeding in some spectrograms. That's convenient because like, it's what we'll be using throughout this series for generating sound in the end. Okay, so we feed like these spectrograms into the encoder and then the encoder will encode the, uh, the original spectrograms into a point within this two-dimensional space or the latent space, okay? Now, What's going to happen is that when we feed this point into the decoder, hopefully the autoencoder or the decoder in this case is going to be able to reconstruct the spectrogram. And this reconstructed spectrogram, hopefully, is going to be very similar to the original uh, spectrogram that we fed as input into the encoder in the first place. Okay, so now if we feed another um, spectrogram, a new spectrogram, probably we're gonna have like another point, say here, like in the latent space. 
and let's assume we feed a third one and a fourth one and a fifth one so as you can see like all the input uh, spectrograms that we feed into the encoder get mapped onto a point in the two-dimensional latent space okay so now we've learned a representation of the spectrograms and all the inputs that we fed into uh, the network. Okay, so now how do we generate stuff? Well, first of all, we can drop the encoder parts because we don't need that for generation. What we actually need is the latent space, so the representation that we've learned, as well as the uh, decoder. So here, the basic intuition is that we can sample a new dot in this latent space that's different from all the other dots that we've learned uh, or that we've encoded at learning to a training time and uh, that dot can be used to generate a new spectrogram so how do we do that well we sample a dot let's assume like it's this green dot here and then we feed that into the decoder and hopefully uh, the decoder is going to generate a spectrogram that makes sense. But now, since we've sampled a dot that's uh, different from all the other dots like that we've learned uh, during training, the spectrogram that we output is going to be different from all the other spectrograms. And so we are generating new data. So basically, the idea here is that we can use the latent space and sample it and sample points in there pass this through the decoder in order to generate new uh, spectrograms or new images or new real audio depending on how, on the different types of like data we've used like for training okay now this is not this is not going to be like this simple with autoencoders because they have like certain limitations but the basic idea that we are using here for generation with autoencoders is the one that we'll actually use in the upgraded version of an autoencoder, which is a variational autoencoder. So if you want to learn more about like all the kind of limitation of autoencoders and why this is not necessarily uh, so easy, so like this process is not necessarily so easy like, to use with autoencoders, so you have to wait like, for the next video where we'll see autoencoders limitations once we uh, create uh, autoencoders once we code it. Let's move on to denoising. So let's see how we can denoise data using autoencoders. Here we are back to the original visualization that we used of autoencoders. Now we can uh, denoise any type of data, audio, images, but obviously we'll be using audio as an example here. So what we want to do is start with some normal like audio. The next step is to add some kind of noise to that audio file. So it could be like white noise, it could be like the noise of a car engine, you name it really. But the basic idea is that we want a corrupted version of the original audio. And this is what we're going to be feeding into the network. But basically the idea is that what we want at the uh, output of this network of this autoencoder is a reconstructed audio that's going to be equal to the original audio that's um, basically without any noise. So how can we obtain that? So because like that sounds like really difficult. So we start like with so we feed like noisy data, noisy audio, and then. We expect for, for the network like to come up with like the original audio without noise. Well, it all depends on the reconstruction error that we'll use. In other words, we'll measure the reconstruction error of the output against the original audio, right? So instead of like you create uh, having like the reconstruction error being the difference between the output and the noisy input, we'll have the difference of the output with the original audio without noise. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. This sounds like really interesting. But how can like an autoencoder then like denoise? Well. The whole point, once again, is this bottleneck, is the latent space. So what we are hoping to do, 
by using like this reconstruction error, which like these two elements, so the output and the original audio, is to uh, capture the most important uh, features of audio and encode them here in the latent space and leave out the unnecessary details or unnecessary features like noise, for example. So the, the hope is that we're gonna learn a representation here uh, in the bottleneck that focuses only on the, the part of the signal that we are interested in and leaves out the, the noise that we actually want to cancel. So then basically the idea is that we start with uh, like a noisy signal, we, we encode it down in the latent space uh, and that representation hopefully will leave out like the, the, the noise. And then when we pass it through the decoder, hopefully we'll get back like a, a, an audio file that sounds like more like the original than its noisy version, right? So here you see once again how important it is to have a good representation, a good latent space that focuses on the most important features of our data and leaves out like the unwanted details. Cool, so this is for denoising. So the last uh, application that I want to talk about is anomaly detection, which autoencoders. But in reality, I'm not gonna talk about it right now because I'm planning to publish a new video where it's gonna be like a self-contained video where I'll talk about the anomaly detection task in itself. And then I'm gonna explain how we can use autoencoders and how we can um, write them, code them to, uh, yeah, perform anomaly detection. Now that you have a good idea of what an autoencoder is, how it works and how we can use it in different applications, the next step is to build an autoencoder, specifically a convolutional autoencoder in Keras and Python. So we won't be using uh, sound or audio for training like this autoencoder, rather we're gonna be using images, but because like I want to have like something very simple so that you guys like can really like learn the basics of autoencoders. And then once we'll train and we'll see like this autoencoder in action, we'll also start seeing its limitations in terms of generation. And we'll learn that we need to upgrade this autoencoder to its kind of like cousin called the variational autoencoder. Okay, so I hope you found this video useful. If that's the case, please remember to leave a like. And if you want to watch more videos like this and you want to miss out on any new video, I highly suggest you to subscribe to the Sound of AI channel. If you have any questions or doubts, as always, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. It's all for today. I hope I'll see you next time. Cheers.